Hi, everyone. Brian Lewis here with Kidney Can. It's my pleasure to welcome you back to another joint edition of the National Kidney Foundation's Facebook Live series. Today, we'll be discussing the topic of how to protect your kidneys throughout your kidney cancer journey. My guests today include Dr. Michael Polizzi from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And Dr. Polizzi is a urologist who specializes in the treatment of kidney cancer. Dr. Polizzi, welcome. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks. For, uh, good to see you again. Good to see you again as well. I'm also pleased to announce that we're joined today by Dr. Priya Deshpande. Dr. Deshpande is also at Mount Sinai and Hospital in New York and is a nephrologist, which is essentially a kidney doctor. Dr. Deshpande, welcome. Thank you so much for having me and thank you NKF and Kidney Can for putting this together. Great, great. Well, it's, it's great to have both of you on today. Um, I wanna jump right in. Um, Dr. Deshpande, Help me out with understanding what's the difference between a nephrologist and a urologist and an oncologist? Sure, so, um, so as a nephrologist, my job is to pretty much mainly uh, medically manage kidney disease. And when I mean kidney disease, I specifically mean reduced kidney function, high blood pressure, or some pa patients even have a high amount of protein in the urine too, so we, we manage that. So ultimately, for as a nephrologist, we, um, treat these patients with medications, and we also look at how to better control their risk factors. And by risk factors, I mean high blood pressure and diabetes, which are the most common risk factors for developing kidney disease. We also work very closely with Dr. Polizzi and the urology team um, to, to ma manage these patients before and after surgery. Um, oncology is the management of of specific cancers, and oncologists use different strategies for treatment, including chemotherapy and radiation, to help treat um, the cancer systemically. Great, great. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Dr. Polizzi, so when a, a kidney cancer patient is first diagnosed, they're going to come in to see you, and surgery is a lot of times the first part of the, part of the discussion. Can you talk about assembling the team and talk to the patients out there about uh, the importance of gathering the team, including nephrology? So, uh, so Brian, yes. I mean, one of the first things that we do when a patient is diagnosed with, with kidney cancer, with a kidney lesion for that matter, uh, we look at what are our options for that patient. In general, surgery is still the standard of care, uh, meaning that we don't give chemotherapy, immunotherapy, but rather we jump jump straight to some type of surgical procedure. Uh, that can be as simple as removing just the tumor itself uh, with something called a partial nephrectomy where we remove just the tumor and leave the rest of the kidney behind or a radical nephrectomy where we have to take the entire kidney as well as all the surrounding lymph nodes in that area. Um, sometimes we're able to do something called an ablative therapy or a, a, a therapy where we're just burning or freezing off the tumor. That can, that can be done as a, a percutaneous approach, so meaning we put a needle through the back and just burn the tumor off if it's small enough. Um, other times we can do that if uh, direct with direct visualization through a laparoscopic or robotic approach. So it really depends on the situation. You know, uh, we have changed a lot how we manage kidney tumors in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, we have techniques now that just didn't exist up until uh, the last uh, decade. Uh, that includes robotic and laparoscopic techniques. Prior to this, you would have surgery, you would have a big incision under the rib cage, we'd have to remove part of your rib uh, to even get to where the kidney was. Uh, the standard of care at that time was to remove the entire kidney uh, in situations even with a small tumor, which didn't make any sense, uh, or at that time made sense, but now, nowadays doesn't make any sense. And that's part of what we're talking about here is how we can actually remove oncologically or, or remove a, a tumor with cancer control, with not uh, compromising cancer function, but then also preserving kidney function at the same time. So we were removing a tumor, removing that cancer safely, but then also keeping patients with their full kidney function so they can go on to live normal lives. And kidney function is important, not only obviously for uh, routine physiologic uh, uh, or, or routine physiology and day-to-day -day, uh, activities, but we also have to think sometimes you may have surgery, but then you may need other treatments as well where your kidney function is also equally important. Uh, so chemotherapies, immunotherapies, and we can certainly talk about that as well. Right. Great, great stuff. So in assembling your team at a, one of the things that Kidney Can believes in is trying to drive folks to a care center that has got a high volume uh, concentration of patients, because generally speaking, this is a pretty specific area of, of of oncology. Can you comment about the teams that you assemble at Mount Sinai and others across the country might want to consider? 
Sure, absolutely. So, so like, like you uh, um, stated there, Brian, it's important to find a high volume center, a center where you have uh, people who are used to taking kidney can taking care of patients who have kidney cancer and kidney tumors. Uh, that would include obviously your surgeon should have uh, experience with uh, taking care of uh, kidney tumors. Uh, it would also include nephrologists who have that experience, medical oncologists who would deal with chemotherapy and immunotherapy, both potentially before and after surgery. Uh, we also may have some other people who are involved, for instance, in the, in the nutrition side. So if you do have some kidney failure or, or a kidney insufficiency, that you may want uh, to change your diet, for instance, so that you uh, prolong the kidney function as much as possible. So all, these are things that we do at, at where I'm at Mount Sinai. We've, we've assembled a, a multidisciplinary team of both urologists, nephrologists, medical oncologists, and other people to help researchers as well. It's important to get everyone together in the, in the same room. We, we happen to have a, a meeting uh, that we meet at least once a, once a month. Nowadays, of course, with our with the COVID uh, times, we're doing this over Zoom. Previously, it was always in person, but uh, Funny enough, uh, the, the Zoom conferences have become quite effective because it allows everyone, uh, wherever they are during the day, to sort of get together, even for just an hour, uh, you know, hour a month, and we sort of go over topics that, that make sense. Um, so, it, it, and again, not everyone has to have a multidisciplinary team, but I think as a patient, you want to set up uh, a team where you are going to be taken care of uh, as an individual. So obviously a surgeon is important, a nephrologist is important, an oncologist is important. And even if there isn't a, a place that has this already set up, you can set this up yourself as a patient. And, 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 that's, and that's really what you need to start off with. Okay, great stuff. So let me, let me put this back to Dr. Deshpande. So in talking about assembling the team, I'm going to set up a hypothetical for those who are on the call today to listen in and see if they can equate some of what they're going through. So let's just say we have a patient, hypothetically, middle-aged, presents at the hospital, um, is diagnosed with kidney cancer, perhaps has had a partial nephrectomy, perhaps even a radical, and now it's follow-up time, and it's time to figure out what's going on next, and we're talking about protecting the kidneys. And we hear the word bounced around nephrotoxicity. Can you dive into that a little bit and talk to the folks out who are listening in? Sure. Um, so uh, nephrotoxicity can happen as a result of medications. It can happen as a result of IV uh, intravenous contrast that patients can get to monitor. Um, so ultimately, um, patients who have had uh, a radical nephrectomy, especially if they do need uh, systemic chemotherapy uh, delivered by an oncologist, some of these um, chemotherapeutic agents can cause direct toxicity to the remainder kidney. Um, on top of that, um, if they had some underlying chronic kidney disease in the past and their risk factors, which I mentioned before, are high, high blood pressure, diabetes, are not controlled, they can develop further damage to their remainder kidney or remainder whatever is left of their, of their kidney mass. Um, and so um, ultimately, uh, nephro we have to manage their... Um, different medications and different dosing of medications to prevent further toxicity to their remainder kidney. Um, in addition to uh, chemotherapies, certain pain medications such as NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, they take that for pain after surgery, that can also further affect their, their remainder kidney. Um, so we have to um, you know, work together with the urology team, the oncology team um, to, to kind of um, come up with a reasonable plan to protect the kidney function as much as possible. Well, let, let's dive into that a little bit more because you, you use some, some language and I, and I comment to a lot of folks that when I was diagnosed and dropped into the world of kidney cancer and, and kidney care and nephrology, there's this whole new vernacular, new, new uh, language that you have to learn. So you said NSAIDs, um, which, which is an inflammatory. So let's maybe go through some of the things. What, what are some of the things you want to avoid or want to take more of? Absolutely. So, um, more so of. medications called like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they are, they include ibuprofen, naproxen, um, the, the brand names are Advil or Motrin or Aleve. These are these are medications that may ultimately they ultimately affect if they're taken in large amounts, especially they, they ultimately affect the blood vessels around the kidney, and they reduce blood flow to the kidney, causing a problem with the kidney function. So, in patients who have um, underlying renal disease, and if they have a nephrectomy as a result of kidney cancer, we do recommend that these patients not take those medications so that we don't change. The, the vascular or blood flow around the kidney. 
Um, also, um, sometimes in order to monitor kid, um, to in order to monitor the the other kidney, the kidney that wasn't initially affected by the with the cancer, or, or monitor for the the possibility of spread of cancer. Sometimes, oncolo the oncology team and the urology team may need to do further imaging. And um, we, we usually take this on a case-by-case -case basis, especially for patients who require intravenous um, CAT scan contrast. Sometimes that contrast can affect the kidney function as well. But we have strategies to help mitigate the, the effects of the contrast. And ultimately, if the nephrologist is very, um, is very um, certain that the patient may have damage from intravenous contrast, we can talk with the urology team and the oncology team to figure out other strategies to look at Look for any, um, uh, pretty much look uh, look for any other uh, uh, um, signs of cancer in the other kidney, or or do surveillance for for kidney kidney screening, kidney cancer screening. Okay, great, great. So let me see if I can understand that the NSAIDs that you want to avoid are are those that you mentioned, but taking something like an acetaminophen that might be okay. Yeah, that, that should be okay. Exactly, as long as we follow the um, the instructions about the dosing on the box and not um, uh, take too much of the acetaminophen, which can sometimes have liver toxicities. You know, we we okay. should be able to manage pain with that. So, so Dr. Polisi, back to the hypothetical. Let's say we have this this patient that you are following up after surgery and. Um, they are going to go on a scanning process over the next several years to follow up to make sure everything's under control. And they're going to be looking, they're going to come in for testing. And that'll include the contrast or non -con without contrast uh, scans. But what about the, the blood test that you're checking for certain chemicals and other things in your blood test, like, you know, the GFR rate or the creatinine rate? Can you talk about those for folks who might not be familiar with those terms? Absolutely. So, the um, so it's really a two-part question. So, let's we'll start with the, the GFR, which is uh, which stands for the glomerular filtration rate (GFR). Uh, that is a, a way that we measure how well your kidney is functioning, how well it's actually filtering, um, and that's an important number because that also lets us know whether or not a patient is going to be able to get contrast for certain studies. Um, and so just to, just to uh, hang on to what uh, Dr. Deshpande said, you know, after surgery or after any kind of treatment with kidney cancer, it's important to uh, establish a surveillance protocol. So patients, uh, there is always a chance, even if the surgery goes very successfully, there's always a chance for recurrence. And so that's why it's important to have good imaging and good follow-up. And so that follow-up is dependent on the type of imaging that you have, whether it's a CAT scan, an MRI, uh, an ultrasound. Uh, well, the CAT scan and MRI, preferably we like to give contrast because that's how we determine whether or not there is a recurrence. And so even more of a reason we want the GFR to be higher so that patients can receive contrast safely uh, and without them having other problems uh, associated with that. So, uh, for instance, patients that uh, have uh, low GFRs and creatinines of greater than uh, 1.5 to 1.9 um, quite often, the, these are these are patients that can't get contrast for CT scans, uh, because then the, the risk is the the contrast may make the the renal function even worse, may actually shut off the the function that's there. Uh, this is why it's important to drink plenty of water, hydrate well before you get any kind of a contrast study uh, to make sure you really flush out the um, uh, flush out the uh, the contrast. Uh, you know, we work with the, the nephrologists all the time. There are other things that we can do. For instance, if there there are situations where we have to give contrast because otherwise we just won't see anything, we just won't be able to determine if there's a recurrence. There are other medications we can give that can be protective. We can sometimes hydrate patients beforehand intravenously. That can be helpful. So all of this uh, kind of comes together. What, uh, what is the chemical agent within the contrast that's causing the concern? It's a great question. So, so the, the contrast, it used to be that there's iodine in there, a lot of these, uh, and that can sometimes be a, not only a, a reaction or allergy, but also there's heavy metals in these contrasts that can affect the kidney function themselves. Um, iodine is generally not in these contrasts and in, in these CT scan contrasts anymore, but they, they're still still a bit of an issue uh, just just because of the metals that are in there. You, this is what we're actually determining. So these metals are kind of what light up in the, in the imaging, and so that lets us know if something has what's called activity or not activity. So when there's a tumor, you'll see it light up, and that would indicate that there's activity, and thus then our radiologist lets us know, oh, look, here's a tumor, here's a possible recurrence, possible metastases, and that, and then what gives us a, uh, an area to go go after during the surgery. 
So let me see if I can recap. So we, we want to hopefully be able to use acetaminophen, but stay away from some of the other NSAIDs. We want to monitor our GFR, and the higher the GFR, the better. Okay. And then the creatinine level, we want it to be somewhere in the 1.5 to Actually, lower than that. So 1.0 is technically normal, okay? okay. Uh, creatinine is actually an indirect measurement of, of kidney function. It's, it's a byproduct of our metabolism. Um, and so what happens is we, we can measure that in the urine, uh, in the blood and in the urine as well. Uh, and that lets us know uh, approximately how well our kidneys are functioning. So one is generally the sort of the, norm, the normal number. If you're a larger male, muscular, it could be a little bit higher. 1.2 to 1.3 could be normal for you, but something in, in that range. Okay. And so, Dr. Despande, um, back to the hypothetical, you're following up this patient three months later. They, they're getting ready to come into the, to the hospital or, or to, to be administered a, a scan. Tell us one week out, one day out, what they should be doing and getting ready for. Sure. So usually um, when it comes to if, if a patient has um, you know, reasonable kidney function and we decided with the urology team that the CAT scan contrast is the best study for this patient, um, usually, um, I, I mean, it, I usually don't make any changes until about a day out of, outside of their procedure. If they're taking, for example, um, diuretic medications or water pills, for example, um, such as furosemide or hydrochlorothiazide, as long as the patient's blood pressure is relatively controlled, I may just ask them to hold off on taking that water pill for about 24 hours um, before their CAT scan is done. I also ask them to drink a lot of fluids um, both before and after their CAT scan. And for patients that, are, that I'm specifically worried about, I'll usually have them check their kidney function before their study is um, just to establish a baseline and about 24 to 48 hours after their study. Um, it's not uncommon though to see um, the GFR uh, decline a little bit after the contrast study, but usually um, the, the, the kidney function kind of pops back up again and they go back to their baseline. Um, it's uh, pretty rare, though, to have patients to have uh, to, to have sustained low GFRs after a contrast. So, um, and that's why I like to monitor these monitor these patients pretty carefully. Even though I know the likelihood of them having a low GFR after contrast is um, is, is unlikely. I think it's a, a bit of peace of mind for everybody. Got it. Got it. So it sounds as if um, you know a lot of water is involved leading up to and after any of these scans. That's a key, a key takeaway for folks. Yeah, exactly. I think just to flush out the dye and um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think in terms of how, how much hydration is, is still kind of unclear. But as Dr. Polisi mentioned, for patients who you know may be at a higher risk, we can we can give them intravenous fluid right before their CAT scan, and there's a specific algorithm to follow for that. Um, but in terms of, um, uh, yeah, I, I usually ask my patients to drink like three or four more glasses of water the day before and the, the day after their CAT scan, um, just to just to help flush things out, as Got long it. as we can tolerate it. So let, let's keep running with this a little bit, and, and th that's good information around scans and follow-up. In general, just going about folks going about their lives, are there any myths out there that we should bust? Are there any tips that, you know, we, we, we've talked previously about how physical activity can help you in your recovery process. Are there any other protection ideas or, or essentials? Um, I, I think that the topic about water is always asked, like, how much water should I be drinking? I think I get that question a lot from patients. Um, I mean, obviously our body is mostly made out of water, so we do need a good amount of water to keep ourselves hydrated. The typical recommendation is around eight or nine cups of water, which is around two liters of water. Um, but this is, the, I think we have to take this with a grain of salt because ultimately um, patients who have lower kidney function shouldn't be drinking as much water. They may have an issue with excreting the water. Uh, if they, so I don't want, so ultimately we're, for those kind of patients, we're worried about developing leg swelling or um, fluid congestion in the, in the lungs. So we have to, it's, it's really important to talk with your nephrologist about how much you should be drinking. For patients with normal kidney function, typically they tolerate that degree of water, about nine cups, just fine. If for whatever reason they're working out or, you know, um, a lot, or it's a hot 90 degree summer month, then they should be increasing their fluid intake just to, just to kind of keep with hydration. Um, the other thing is a lot of, um, in terms of data for looking at how water affects kidney function, 
there really isn't good data. We've, there's been some studies about looking at impaired kidney function to see if um, intaking water actually helps with that, but that, that's that been, um, nothing really has panned out with that. So I think it, it, people try to drink water to help with their kidneys, but it's it, there's really no data supporting that. Obviously, if you're if you're very severely dehydrated, that can affect your kidney function, and that's why we have to be very cautious in, in the, these hot months. But um, so it sounds like personalized medicine is the yeah, way to go. Make exactly. sure every is taken care. <laughs> yeah. So, Doctor Polizzi, um, high blood pressure. A lot of folks probably that you see are suffering from some kind of high blood pressure. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of protecting your kidneys and and going forward? Absolutely. So, so high blood pressure, hypertension. Uh, these are this no question. That's one of our quote unquote kidney killers. That that uh, sustained high blood pressures puts a lot of stress and strain on the kidney function and will start to create uh, so um, tubular damage. So the, the actual meat of the kidney, the actual uh, functioning portion of the kidney will start to decline over time. And that's in fact what, what Dr. Desponde deals with a lot. And so um, you know, being on your blood pressure medications is extremely important, making sure you keep your blood pressure below a certain threshold, um, exercise, losing weight, these are all extremely important for, for kidney protection. Uh, so obviously, the, the patient that's a diabetic who uh, is, is morbidly obese, these are the patients that are more, more likely than not to end up with some kind of kidney dysfunction over time. Um, and just to go back to the other questions, you know, like, like Dr. Spondi said, I, have, I always get asked, how much water should I really drink? Uh, and that, and I think probably if I had a dime every time I heard that would be <laughs> great. Uh, but it, it's it's a it, it's a it's a uh, it's it's a basically a loaded question. It really depends on your patient. So I, I had tend to see a lot of kidney stone patients because of my my area expertise. My area of expertise is kidney uh, diseases and and uh, and uh, surgical kidney uh, situations. So kidney stones are, are very common amongst my patients, and those are patients that we definitely want to have drink a lot of water because we want to dilute out as much of the uh, the crystals as possible. On the other and we also have patients that don't have good kidney function to begin with and have high blood pressure. And now they also have kidney stones. Now we're sort of a rock and a hard place. These are patients that ideally should be drinking a lot of water. But then if I have them drink too much water, then we have the other situation was where they get volume overloaded or fluid overloaded and they have also big issues. So may, may, uh, to cut to the chase here, Ryan, you know, the blood pressure is absolutely important when it comes to kidney function. It's super important to, to uh, watch your blood pressure on a regular basis, not just for your kidneys, but other important um, uh, uh, activities in your body. Um, and, you know, I, we can't stress enough that uh, exercise and losing weight uh, are, are extremely uh, important parts of that as well. Great. Well, that's a good segue here because we're starting to get some questions in from the folks watching on Facebook. So if I can ask you a couple of questions that are coming in, I want to remind those that are watching today that all of the questions that are being asked today will be on the Facebook Live, I'm sorry, on the Facebook pages of both the National Kidney Foundation and Kidney Can. So here we have one question from uh, Judah out there who asks, um, are there different types of contrast for MRI versus CT scans? Yes. Doctor, go um, ahead. I can take that question. Um, yes, there are different types of contrasts. Um, the, as Dr. Polizzi mentioned, um, the CAT scan contrast is um, it, it, prior. It was it was this iodinated compound. Um, I think it's a different molecular base at this point. Um, the the get the MRI contrast is called gadolinium, and that's that's a heavy metal. Um, and um, they both serve the same purpose. They both are to highlight um, the flow, pretty much activity or flow of blood to a tumor, um, and uh, they both are, um, so, so in terms of like MR, uh, in terms of renal function, for example, you know, they, they, they both can have an issue that both of the types of contrast can have an issue with in patients with chronic kidney disease. And again, uh, we, we tend to evaluate this on a case by case basis with the urologist. Great. And Dr. Polizzi, a follow up to you is, um, should patients be doing their own home blood pressure monitoring? So, uh, well, it's become very common now. So a lot of, a lot of patients really can, can do that nowadays, especially with all the gadgets that we have, our iPhones, our Samsung phones. There's, there's a, there are whole health applications and apps that are available. Um, a lot of the cardiologists will do this. They'll do home readings where you, where you can do your own blood pressure and then get sent to your cardiologist. 
Uh, I've probably, Dr. Spondi probably has something similar that she uses. You know, that, that that's, I think, absolutely something that is not is a must. I actually will have patients write it down, sort of a, like a diary. Um, I have them do for any, anything, just not just blood pressure. You know, for instance, if I'm tracking uh, how how well they're urinating, uh, I'll, I'll have them do a diary as well. Uh, and that way we can we know when, when they come to see us what the, what's actually happening at home. So there's obviously, we, we only see patients for a, a certain, you know, tw- a 15, 20 minute slot during the day. But we really need to know what's happening at home, a sort of long term, and that's where the blood pressure readings and, and anything else, for that matter, uh, becomes important. Good, good. So another follow-up question from Sandra is: Is drinking too much tea a problem? Drinking might be the kind of tea they're talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think the tea is an issue, but I, I think I mean ultimately we're, she's probably just talking about fluid at some at some level. You know, I think fluid intake. Um, for the most part, again, if you have kidney, if normal kidney function, normal kidney function can, normal kidneys can excrete water pretty well. Um, yes, there is a problem with drinking too much water because your kidneys can only, even if your your kidneys are trying to get rid of all the water you're taking, there's there's a limit to that. Your kidneys can't. Um, at some level, there's a there's an upper there's a lower limit for what you know how much water your kidneys can actually even normal kidneys can actually excrete. So. Um, you know, I think um, the, in terms of the teas, I, I, I would have to look into different teas for um, looking at Maybe we that. could do this as a follow-up on the Facebook and get yeah. some more details. Absolutely. Another follow-up question from Wolfgang was, um, what is a good blood pressure for a dialysis patient? Sure. So I, I, see, I do see a good, a decent number of dialysis patients. Um, I would probably say around about like 130 over 80 um, or so is probably a decent blood pressure. Um, I know some, a lot of my dialysis patients tend to run a little bit higher. I try to get them, um, I think it's important to work with your nephrologist to make sure that you're on the right medications and there, and during dialysis an adequate amount of fluid is being removed, um, with your dialysis treatment to get you down to your weight that you should be at. Um, so I, I, it's, it is a lot of, it's, um, ideally, we would love to see everybody's blood pressure running between 130s to 140s, but I, I understand that it's it can be challenging for some patients. Okay, so maybe we can, um, we're going to have to start wrapping up here in a couple of minutes, but maybe we could talk real briefly about any myths that might be out there. Could you dispel any myths, Dr. Polizzi, around the, sort of the, the protecting the kidney? Um, sure. Actually, before that, I just want to talk about the, the tea question, actually. It probably... I can talk, t- speak a little bit about that because teas are actually, uh, for a lot of patients, for instance, my kidney stone patients, teas can actually cause kidney stones. Uh, and so patients that uh, that are prone to that, there's something called known as oxalate that can quite often be in tea, black teas in particular, uh, that leads to crystal formation. Um, and teas, especially uh, sort of uh, teas that are caffeinated, can also be a little bit of a problem because they, they can actually dehydrate you because you'll, you'll it's, it's like a diuretic. Caffeine is a diuretic, will make you urinate more. And so again, you know, that's not ideal for someone who's trying to hydrate for kidney stones or if you're if you're trying to drink extra water to keep your renal function up uh, to a certain level, you don't want to necessarily take something like alcohol and caffeine because that can, can inadvertently dehydrate you as well. Um, you know, one of my rules of thumb when I tell patients that uh, can I drink a cup of coffee, can I have a glass of tea, I say, or a cup of wine, or a glass of wine, go ahead and do that, but then chase it with a glass of water, and that's sort of, you know, it's a sort of a, a rule of thumb that way you you keep your water intake a little bit higher. So going guys back to you know myths, like you said, um, you know some of the things that uh, people talk about is you know are, are there are there certain medications, certain uh, nutritional supplements I can take that uh, will help my kidney function. You know, I think you have to be a lot very careful with a lot of these nutritional supplements. Um, these are uh, these do have function uh, functionality. I mean, they 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 absolutely can can be effective in certain things, and that's exactly the problem. Uh, you don't know what is actually doing because they haven't been studied properly. You don't know what kind of amounts you're getting. You don't know how how high those levels are. Um, I've seen, especially when patients are taking other active medications, so, so prescribed medications, pharmaceutical grade medications, and then adding a nutraceutical or some other type of a, 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 um, a natural homeopathic medication, they may interact. You may never know. We would never know because no one studied that. And so I'm always wary of, of, of saying, yeah, go ahead and, and, and use that because I just don't, you know, I don't even know what I'm, at. I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, saying that is, is okay because there just haven't been any studies. That's the major issue. 
Yes, and one of the things that I, I heard quite a bit from, I asked a lot of the same questions in, in my follow-up of, you know, what, do I, what should I be doing more of, what should I be doing less of, and the word I kept coming across is moderation. I was told repeatedly, just right. be moderate and then you'll be okay. So on that note, um, in, in the follow-up months after surgery and if you're diagnosed, tell us about nutrition and, and might maybe how we could tie in some of the diet components to all of this going forward. Dr. Deshpande, you want to give that a, a try? I can, um, I can uh, start with, um, so I, for patients who have high blood pressure, for example, in addition to medications and lifestyle, um, we, the, the, one of the bigger, one of the biggest dietary changes that, that may need to be, be made is um, reducing their sodium intake, their salt intake in the course of, uh, of a day, ultimately. So for, um, for diabetics, the the, the, the uh, sorry sorry for high blood pressure patients, that the guidelines say that they recommend less than two teaspoons of salt in the course of a day. So that's that's very little salt, and I feel like a lot of patients don't even. It's kind of hard to grasp what two teaspoons is like as well, you know. So I um, so I think for 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 my patients, I, I generally tell them to take a look at the nutrition labels on um, on their food. Ultimately, um, the nutrition labels is, it shows. Uh, the amount or the percentage of sodium, and that's per serving. So we're looking for less than five percent sodium, and that's called low. That's low salt ultimately, but that's also per serving. So we want um, the patient to follow the, the the serving recommendation in order to adhere to that low salt, uh, the, the low salt um, part of their diet. However, if they have a you know low sodium can of soup, for example, and there are two servings in the can of soup and they, they end up having the whole thing, that's already like a normal amount of salt that they've got. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think following the serving size is very, very important. Um, uh, other things for diet, um, especially again with, with uh, impaired kidney function, um, and we have, there are some electrolyte problems that patients with impaired kidney function can develop. Um, the, the biggest one is uh, having a high potassium. And uh, potassium is pretty much in anything that we eat. Um, most most things have a good, uh, have uh, most of the uh, like fruits and vegetables have a, a pretty robust amount of potassium. But uh, unfortunately, patients with impaired kidney function may have a problem excreting that potassium. So as a result, we may have to put patients on like a lower potassium diet, um, and that to, that pretty much means to try to avoid foods like bananas, tomatoes, potatoes, a lot of stuff that people like, unfortunately. But at the same time, when I tell them what not to eat, I try to tell them what they can eat. So there are certain fruits and vegetables that have lower potassium, and that can help regulate their electrolytes as well. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think, unfortunately, we've run out of time, folks. And, and that, that said, I'd like to remind you all that this is the first of a three-part series on kidney cancer. And I encourage all of you to join us again when we discuss the next time what you need to know in order to take control of your kidney cancer. And then on the third segment, we'll be discussing some of the treatments to consider after kidney cancer. And so in case we didn't get around to answering your questions today, please check back on the National Kidney Foundation's and or Kidney Can's Facebook page, and we'll be able to answer all the, and provide all the answers there. I'd really like to thank the sponsors today for their generous support in making this program possible. And I'd especially like to thank Dr. Despande and Dr. Polizzi for joining us today and helping to make sense of what I know could be a very difficult subject for so many people. So, so thank you, Dr. Polizzi. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. Thank Great. you, Dr. Despande. Thank you so much. On behalf of the National Kidney Foundation and Kidney Can, I'd like to wish you all good health. Thank you. All the best.